All righty. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to our panel. I'm here with uh, Igor Kozlov, who gave us a great talk on how they use uh, data science, specifically machine learning uh, at Bell Canada to, to do detection engineering. We have Matthew Sonier. I think I got that right this time. Uh, for, who just finished his talk, which was full circle detection. And then we have a bonus guest, Carlos, a.k.a. Plug, who is uh, a threat hunting team lead at the Paranoids and uh, it has some really great contributions on the community end of uh, detection engineering and detection response in general. So, uh, guys, I appreciate your time and hopefully we, we get to talk about some things. I know we have some uh, some community questions that we want to go into, uh, but first I wanted to kind of set the stage uh, based off the talk that we just heard. Uh, Matthew, how, how important is it? So I kind of in the intro talked about how uh, one of the big differences between kind of like the red side and the blue side is that the blue side is very much a team sport, right? So like you don't just get to, if you're trying to do this thing all by yourself, you're going to have a hard time, right? So we need to, uh, and that, that could be both internally and externally. So internally, we need to work with our partners who uh, are on other teams. Maybe they're on the infrastructure team. Uh, maybe maybe they're the incident responders when we're building detections or uh, community wise, you know, sharing that information. So uh, and I'll, I'll kind of get everybody's opinion on this. But how important is it to kind of share uh, or work as a team to try to bolster our uh, ability to perform detection and response? Yeah, I think it's one of the key thing um, in this thing. And that that's, that's the whole thing that I was talking about at the end of the talk. Right. Um, I think that the red teamers. Uh, share a lot, they do blogs, they share their tools, they share their TDPs and everything. And the defender, there's always this, this kind of almost false sense that everything is intellectual property, that if we share, we're going to expose um, our, our defenses to the attackers. Uh, but as I said in this talk, and, and I said it again, but lots of the things that we're bailing detection for are actually already known. So there, there's nothing, it's not an intellectual property to look at LSAS or to, to make sure that, that we, we get notification when LSAS is touched or in this case, when those files are created. So yeah, and that, that's for, uh, for the whole community and, and inside. Um, it, it's a bit harder when you're a team of one. And that's when I think you need to um, rely more on the community. And, and that's why I think it's so important to share with the community. If you're lucky enough to be in a team that has many people that specialize in different things, some such as threat hunting for Carlos or machine learning like Igor or um, threat hunting or, or whatever, building detection or extremely strong on, as you mentioned, on the data collection on building pipelines. If you share all of those things that you're building as a whole team, and that the smaller player can help, I think the whole community benefits. We're going to see less breach. We're going to see better protected company. And it, it all goes together. It's, it's, it's one of the main reasons why I like to do talks is to try to share the knowledge that I was lucky enough to gain through all of the other people that I admire. Awesome. Yeah, great. Um, so one of the questions that just came in that I think is kind of uh, moves through that, that kind of line of questioning pretty well is... Uh, the idea that attackers are quickly coming up or very rapidly coming up with new attack techniques. How do, how, like, what's a good way? And I think, I think it's important kind of implied in the question. It's important to have a goal for your detection efforts, right? So like you always want to have a target that you're trying to, trying to achieve that way you can validate whether or not you achieved it. Right. So like, how do you, how do you judge it? Um, so how, like, does anybody have good ideas on how you can actually prioritize what you're looking for? So like, for instance, Igor looked for, credential abuse or, uh, you know, Matthew, you were looking for, uh, you know, outlook abuse. Um, how do you choose what to look at? Is it just, Hey, I saw something cool and I think I should go after it. Or is there actually like a process for, uh, determining that I'll, I'll go to Igor first. We'll say. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, I just wanted to go first because I also wanted to comment, um, on something that you said, uh, before my presentation and also, which was exactly related to what, uh, Matthew was now talking about. Uh, so I, I, th I think what, what you mentioned, just to uh, remind everyone, is that you said that uh, analysts lack context oftentimes. Uh, data scientists say, oh, this is anomalous, and then analysts look into it and uh, like, why? So, and I think um, uh, this uh, exactly relates to what uh, Mathieu um, was mentioning and also uh, to the, his idea that people working together are always stronger. And I just want to say that uh, I worked with uh, Mathieu personally, and I know that uh, 
he was uh, when he was uh, threatened and team lead at uh, Bell. So he said when he was building a team uh, who is extremely successful, uh, we have a lot of superstars there. Uh, so he said, I want people very different. I don't want the uh, same type of people. So, and here I would like to, again to uh, circle back to what you said. So why analysts don't know, um, have lack of context? It's because other scientists never work with analysts. And th from my point of view, this is uh, the hugest problem. Uh, so, so people coming together with very different backgrounds. Um, so this is when, when we have the power. So now going back to what you said, so priorities are usually set in corporate environment uh, by other people. Uh, but uh, just uh, my personal comment would be, um, so I, I was mentioning credential attack in the, in the presentation as an example. I was also saying uh, that it can be extended to lateral movement and other TTPs. So credential attack is just uh, uh, one that everybody knows about kind of, it's easy to sell. And um, so indeed, um, um, not everything can be equally easy attacked uh, with, for example, machine learning techniques that are out there boxed for you. For that reason, um, whenever somebody tells me, oh, let's use machine learning here, I say, well, can I please look at the data first and talk to people who have a lot of experience in this field and then uh, come up with uh, what will be the timeline for the solution? And sometimes uh, managers would agree that, uh, okay, so indeed it seems uh, like a simple problem, but solution would be very complex. So we don't have data, although we don't have experts. So I would say um, we indeed prioritize according to the uh, enterprise. So they have, uh, uh, they are decision metrics. They involve a lot of smart people, uh, uh, like experts in the field, to say what is priority. Uh, right? We have uh, a lot of uh, industry research on that. But also, uh, when it comes to machine learning, um, I think it's important to understand that uh, data is the king. In a sense, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have good data, um, it will not work. Thanks. Um, awesome. I, I yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I will. I, so this is an interesting topic, and and in particular, because um, I hear it often. How do I get started? You know, what do I do? And I think it's important to start with the notion that there are different business and business sizes and organization sizes. So it would start with that, right? So um, take into account that because you want to start simple, regardless of the size. The key is that you find a way to scope things, and you really want to narrow scopes. Uh, there are multiple ways to do that. Either you know you use trade intelligence, you take the trade intelligence approach. Who are, you know? What are the ATP, APTs, actors that are you know um, after us? Um, you can look at vulnerabilities. You know what operating systems do we have, and what are we vulnerable to? Uh, you can look at um, a project where you design what your crown jewels are. What are the systems that I'm worried about? Uh, maybe you know you're worried about insider threat. So. You, you, there are multiple ways. You, you have to pick one and try it. And if it doesn't work, go to the next one. That's, that's probably one of the most important things I want to make sure people know. There isn't, we're here, but it's not like we, there is a solution that applies to everyone. You have to try it a few things and you'll find how things work out. But you have to iterate. You have to try it, be methodical. And that's the other thing. You have to find a way where you can develop a process. And a process that you can repeat so you can improve it over time. And as you go, you will start seeing the benefits. Um, so to recap, there are many ways to do it. Find one that works for your organization, the size and the type of work that you do. Develop some methodology or borrow one of the many that exist of some of us have provided and then try it. Make sure you incorporate some learning you know, reviews and that you iterate and you will find how you're gonna prioritize things. Um, if in doubt, there's plenty of forums out there where you can come back and chat with many of us and we will happy to dive in further. But that will be kind of like the, the TLDR on this idea. Yeah, yeah. I, I often tell people when people ask me that question, uh, first of all, it's like something is better than nothing. So don't like get to where you're paralyzed, not being able to make a decision and like, you know, use some intuition. If you're just getting started, Think about like, what are the things that I hear about the most and like, go, just go for that. Right. Um, otherwise there's like the threat Intel approach. There's like an entity based approach. Like, uh, for instance, we worked with an airline at one point that, uh, decided to start building detections around their, uh, loyalty system because they knew that there was some interest in hacking their loyalty system. So they, they decided to focus on that. Uh, maybe active directory is something you want to look after. Uh, maybe there's like a uh, tactic based, uh, approach to where you say, Hey, like we know that persistence by definition is persistent and going to be there for a long period of time. 
And so maybe that's a good place for us. We don't have great, you know, collection capability right now, but we know persistence is something that's always going to be there and it, it's meant to last for a long time. So let's focus there first, or maybe we only have collection on domain controllers. And so we want to look for active directory, uh, active directory type, uh, attacks first, because we know that we have, you know, the telemetry to, to do that. Um, Carlos, one thing that you kind of touched on was this idea of continuous improvement, having a process. Uh, one of the things that we like to talk about uh, at my company is the idea that uh, we want to differentiate between when we're successful because we have a single person, which is like individual competence. You have a really smart person who does a great job versus an organization that ha is organizationally competent, meaning that you can replace individuals and uh, or you could hire new people. Uh, or a person could leave and that like the new person's going to come in and plug right into the uh, into the process and know what they're doing because there's documentation, there's, you know, relationships between organizations and expectations and things like that. How important, uh, Matthew, is that in the type of things, uh, the type of concepts that you were talking about with that detection lifecycle of being able to provide that IR playbook and that validation, and those types of things? So just before I go to that, I just want to add two little things about the, the previous question, if you don't mind. So I think that. Um, Having metrics to show how you improve over time is extremely important as well, to show your management that you started at point A and that maybe in Q2 you are at point B and then at, at point C uh, by the time of Q4 and that you're improving. I think this is, is very important. Uh, I made also another talk about that called the SOC counterattack that is based on using the uh, uh, attack framework from MITRE. Um, as a starting point to uh, build your detection program. And the other point is um, where you, when, when you ask where to start, I think that if you have a strong security solution, you might want to know where your current security solution is actually failing. If you have a very strong EDR, but it's weak on the network side, maybe you want to focus on network-based attack um, and, and the other way around, if you have a very strong IPS system and and very far, strong firewalling and zoning, but a bit weaker on the on the endpoint, you might want to focus there. So it really depends, I think, on what you have, and it will depend uh, for each company. So testing testing some new techniques, te 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 testing some known technique, for me, it's extremely important, like a kind of a purple team-ish type of uh, um, approach. I think it's very important. Uh, now to your <laughs> other question about replacing people in a SOC and having one very competent person versus uh, a full team and, and being, uh, I think it's extremely important to teach your, your new people because a SOC is typically somewhere where people will uh, will churn very fast. You'll have new hires, uh, as a, people will, will get promoted, the better ones. They won't stay in that analyst role for a very long time. So it's very important to have uh, something in place that makes those people great fast and make sure that everybody is at the same level. So you don't want to have a rock star, and I don't like that term, but, but like one analyst that is very, very good, whereas your other one are average. You want all your tickets to be handled the same way every time of the day, every time of the year. You don't want to go in during Christmas and think, if if this guy is on shift and, and this type of attack happens, it's, it's, it's doomsday, right? You want that Everyone has the same level of understanding. And that's why I think that the training part is something that's extremely important to bring your analysts to the next level. That will bring the whole SOC to the whole level and that will bring the whole corporation also to the next level in their security maturity. Yeah, and I think, I think uh, one thing you reminded me of is it's probably okay to have a superstar, right? But like as a leader or as somebody that's you know running the program, your F, like your effort and maybe even some of their metrics for you know job performance should be related to how do they give back to the organization make the organization better as opposed to kind of remain like whenever you ask like as a consultant we'll go work with a company and you'll say how does this work and the person or like where is this documented and then the person will point to their head and you're like okay well that's bad right because that's like the the bus theory where if that person gets hit by a bus you're you're in big trouble um one thing that I, I there's two questions that I think are uh, are related, and I think everybody probably has an opinion on this. Uh, the first question is, what uh, what data set? There, I'll give them both and let everybody kind of give a quick answer on on for both of them. What data? The first question is, what data set is always gathered but is ultimately mostly useless? Um, 
And then the the kind of like corollary to that is what data is rarely gathered, but would be very useful if it was. Maybe I'll go to Igor first. Sure. Well, uh, I can start with a funny story, right? Because uh, when I just started, Matteo said, "So what should we do first? And uh, showed me Matteo Tech, and uh, I was like, uh, "Dumpster diver is the easiest one because we can just set a camera, we can just detect people very easily with machine learning." And he was very surprised because uh, for him it was uh, something strange, like why would it be an interesting source at all? And in terms of uh, useless data, I. I, you know, you, I'm the guy who likes data. So for that reason, for me, there is no useless data. I think what, what uh, is useless is if, if um, I look at the data and I don't understand it, and then I go to somebody who, who knows what it is about and can provide insights, this is, that becomes very interesting. So I think not having people who are experts about certain data around uh, is uh, what I don't like. And is this also relates to the superstars? I totally agree with uh, everyone uh, that it's important for everyone to be able to pull. I just want to say that um, uh, superstars I, I like on teams because they inspire uh, with their passion uh, everyone. And uh, really, when you see a, a person who is burning with uh, the idea, it's uh, really something uh, that lets uh, other people also grow and uh, shoot for the stars. So yeah, thanks. Go ahead, uh, Matthew. Um... Well, useless, it, it, it always depends if you want to build detection or if you're talking about forensic. This because is like a religious, I, this is a religious question, by the way. Yeah, basically. yeah, yeah uh, I know, I know. <laughs> but uh, I, I like uh, polarized debates. debates. Uh, but I think firewall um, is slightly overrated. Um, it's hard to build meaningful detection and, and I would say actionable detection based on firewall. On the other end, when you have an incident, Definitely, 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 you do need those firewall logs. So it's it's a double-edged sword, right? You don't want to not have them, but they are extremely chatty. Uh, so it's it's a uh, it's yeah, it's it's a, a difficult question. And the one source uh, that we should have that a lot of people don't have is probably Sysmon, um, because it's such a rich um, data source, and lots of people. And I've seen that in many companies where uh, where I worked or where I was consulting is that they say, well, we have an EDR. It already uh, collect all of this or, or the equivalent. That may be true, but most of the time you cannot do everything you want and you cannot control uh, if you want a very specific event type or a very specific value because there's a new attack, there's a new vector. Uh, you don't have any control. So when you deploy Sysmon, you might have it very... Uh, tone down, if you will, and not duplicate what's collected by your uh, EDR solution or, or any other solution, but at least get the things that your EDR is not collecting, and then you can build meaningful detection based on that. Um, so this is actually a very interesting question, and I'll go back with that. Um, you know, it's about the size and the organization and what you do. In general. Um, I have this idea that data is only useless when it doesn't have or provide any context. And it's our job to find the context of the data. But even then, there is a lot of data that just gets accumulated. If you're not gonna use that data, then it brings absolutely no value to you, even for forensic purposes. So you need to count to the fact that that becomes problematic. If you have a lot of data that brings a lot of noise, or you haven't studied, you you want to you know think about it. Is it time for me to bring that data in for me to use or not? Otherwise, it sometimes it makes things even more difficult. I come from an organization where you get terabytes of data, and so sorting and looking through that is very difficult, and it becomes dense, right? So um, I think it's important to be mindful of that. And one way in which you can figure it out whether data has value to you, right, is to actually do something that it, it connects to the previous questions. You really want to develop or implement a visibility gap assessment. It's really not difficult, and people make it very difficult. Just map all of the applications that provide some telemetry, right, and then identify which of them will bring you value for whatever it is that you're going after, and then prioritize that, onboard it, look at it, investigate it, what makes data much more valuable, and this is where I think you get this weird notion that some data is useless, 
is you need to enrich the data. If the data is enriched, it becomes even more powerful. But when you consume it raw without that enrichment of context, you make the process much more difficult. So I will say that that is very important too. As far as what data is readily available, I will say in the context of what I do, which is threat hunting or incident response, most of the faults that I know, even on threat hunting, they just heavily concentrate on the host side. And you really need to have network telemetry. If you don't have network telemetry, you might not, you're not going to find many things. And that network telemetry is key beyond the host. You really want to know what's happening on the wire. And I will say that that will be one of the best things any organization should concentrate on. If you don't have it, if you, you're good on host, start spending time on the network because it could be the flip that tells you. In fact, sometimes the network telemetry gives you, you know, the, the fact that someone is doing a lot of activity that otherwise you didn't notice on the host level. Yeah. So to add on to that, that I, there's so many things going through my head right now, but to add on to what you're saying about the network is you could also do correlation, right? So for instance, uh, let's say, so attackers use, I've been really interested in service creation recently. So like one of the reasons why that's interesting is because it's uh, frequently used for lateral movement or privilege escalation. However, it's also something that happens a, a ton, right, on, on any, any network. And so like one of, the, one of the things that you do is you say, okay, how do I know when a service has been created? Like I want to know every single time a service is created, or I want to be able to identify every single time a service is created uh, regardless of how it's created, right? So you find, find that, like I kind of, kind of call it the base condition of service creation. But then you, you also want to figure out uh, features or contextual factors that, that will basically you can analyze, right? And so like one of the things that you might, might be interested in because services are used for lateral movement is, was this service created over the network? Well, yeah, the, the best way to get that is by collecting network data, right? So like you could get Sysmon even ID3, which gives you network information, but it doesn't have that granular context of like, this was an RPC request and this is the, you know, RPC protocol that was used and that type of thing, which is really valuable for us to, to evaluate. And so I think that gives you a, a better picture of what's actually, what's actually happening. Yeah. And if you mind actually to stand on the network, because it's a topic that I, I hear often is there are attacks that you actually need the network data to identify them. Beacon is a perfect example, right? Uh, if you don't have data about a, a Chrome, you know, a, a, a browser extension that has been deployed, that has been used for beaconing because it's using uh, DOH, then the the DNS data over the network or some other information will be valuable. You also get JJ3, J3S hashes and other type of hashes. So um, it provides not only context, it allows you to connect, but many times it will be the bullet that will help you identify that there is more uh, you know, going on in the network. So definitely my, my hit is, Network data, it's a must. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Um, what? Okay, so one thing that that kind of reminds me of is um, we we are really focused on we we have this this world where we're really focused on reducing false positives, and I think that's kind of what gets us going towards the machine learning kind of path is how do we reduce false positives in a, in a smart way. Um, but then one of the one of the worries, not necessarily with machine learning, but in false positive reduction is the introduction and in false negatives. And like the problem that I see with that is that false positives are apparent, meaning that you have an alert that tells you that you you have to explicitly say is a false positive. But false negatives are transparent. Right. Um, and so like one of my I guess there's a couple thoughts about that. One thought is um, how do you manage the reduction of false positives? And Igor, I think you you probably have a really well thought out idea of this. Uh, how do you manage reduction of false positives while also managing, you know, your rate of false negatives? Um, and then the second is is how much should we be be wor like we're not building detections in a vacuum. So like you're not just building one detection and saying this is what I'm putting I'm putting all my eggs in this basket and it has to work. You're creating a a kind of series of detections. And so like this one may have a false negative because of X, but you know people don't just perform one attack technique. There's a whole chain of attack techniques. And so like, how important is it to be, you know, worried about false, like the threat of false negatives? Thank you very much. I think it's a, a great, great question, uh, specifically because it also highlights um, uh, one thing. So what uh, people usually know about machine learning is uh, what they learn from uh, popular sources. 
And um, I, I see this a lot. And so when you ask this question, and you're talking about false positives and machine learning, but false negatives doesn't sound the bell of machine learning in a sense. It's it's because um, this is the source, not the textbooks and the professors who've been thinking about it for 70 years. Um, so um, why I mention it, because, so there are uh, very different metrics. Uh, so when we're talking about false positives, it's precision. Um, and when we're talking about false ne negatives, it's recall. And there are a bunch of other metrics that look into both of them uh, as a harmonic mean of, for example, precision of recall and this F1 metric and a lot of other stuff. And there is a lot of a lot of research about it, uh, uh, which also says that you should also not only look into false positive, false negative, you look into everything, uh, all, all, the, all four parts, because otherwise you can misguide, be, be misguided easily. And what, what I want uh, to tell often to um, people uh, who have power in decision making is that um, when they're talking, let's reduce false positives and I say, okay, let's turn off, off all the alerts and we will have no false positives and we will have very good accuracy because most of the times we receive false positives and they don't understand it. So let me just please clarify this idea in, a, in terms of poker because I, in my organization, poker is a big thing. So the idea is that if you play only when you have uh, top uh, four aces, you will be always winning. But will it make you a successful player? Not, no, it will not. Because uh, you have to play with the hand that you have and win with the hand that you have. And uh, so for that reason, it's absolutely paramount not to focus on just one metric. So one metric by itself, so there is again a lot of studies in, in psychology that shows when people's organizations start uh, following one metric, First, they start uh, affecting this metric just to look good, and uh, it never is a good thing. So here I would say, um, when we're talking about false positives, we should be always talking about false negatives at the same time, at least. And um, um, so we should be saying, at this rate of false positives, this is the rate of false negatives. Do we accept this? And um, um, so once again, there is a lot of research, so let's not deep dive into it. Uh, but what I want to tell you is that there is only one way to improve both at the same time is to build better detections. So once you build better detections, you can reduce both false positives and false negatives. And um, sorry for the plug. So in my presentation, I specifically show that if you just use one type of detection and supervised machine learning and rules, you will be not be seen what you will be seen with addition of supervised machine learning on top. And so this is, was, was just one of the examples. Regardless of what you're using, uh, you need to include more and more ideas into the thought process. And as you are saying, so you need to um, bring a lot of a lot of dimensions into the game and you also need to prioritize. This is what the other speakers say and I absolutely agree with this. Um, so machine learning just help you could help you to uh, prioritize it a bit better if you have a lot of data. But if you don't have data, go to the experts. Security experts is your data. They've seen it all. They know how to help you. So. Um, to summarize the, my answer, so look into the problem having uh, uh, multiple dimensions in the sense that uh, bring all type of experts into the game to discuss. And uh, a must is security experts. If you don't have data, they will tell you what to prioritize. They have intuitive understanding of the situation. Just make sure to include also people who know a bit about data because sometimes they can help when because we don't know what we don't know. So bring as much as possible of what you don't know. Bring as much as people that whose background you don't know, and they might help. Thanks. Cool. Uh, anybody else have any opinions on that? Or should we move to the next question? Oh, I have some, definitely. But I want to see if Matthew has some before. I think we might all have opinions. Uh, I'll yeah. give you mine in a moment. Matthew, you want to go first? No, or you want me to go to first? Go, 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 man. So um, this is actually a very interesting question, because you know th there is we are, you're going to encounter as an analyst, as an incident responder, um, you know, your presumptions, right? And um, even when you are seasoned with quotes, th those might come back to bite you. And so you might encounter things that definitely look good, that there's nothing wrong, but they're not, they turn out to be bad, right? You get the, those, those, those things. So I think the first thing is to address that, you know, be, be mindful of the presumptions, right? But then challenge them. Um, I have this notion for me of what threat hunting is. And the way that I define threat hunting is just a methodology that allows me to proactively look for the unknown unknowns. And I use this concept of basically that, the unknown unknowns, right? So if you challenge the presumptions, you're going to find a way to uncover some of the 
false negatives. It is not easy, right? And it takes time and iteration. But one of the ways that I find that you can, uh, uh, it can help you and even actually helps you with the notion of improved detections is unfortunately with um, one of the side effects that I perceive happen when MITRE came up, right? The attack framework is a lot of a lot of folks have zoomed in too much into the atomic type of detections, right? You know, one detection that will help you detect this variant of Mimikatz or something else. So I have this concept of molecular detections. These are detections that are more broad. They try to cover more grounds and they're prone to be, you know, false positive, right? But what you do is you complement with the atomic detections. So you eventually end up with what I call, you know, high confidence detections. It's not easy and it takes some time, but I really encourage people to think molecular. Go one step up and then start looking at the data. And that forces you to do one thing that reduces, in my opinion, false negatives, to understand your data. What happens in your network is unique to your network. And that allows you to determine, is this really bad or it isn't? And how you're going to go about it to challenge that, to determine whether it's one or the other. Um, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> I hope it did. <laughs> yeah, I like to, I like, I I usually talk about detections as being precise or broad, and there's a spectrum to where you're on either end. Pre, like precise would be a, a file hash would be very precise. Basically no false positives, no like no false, or, you know, potentially tons of false negatives depending on what your goal is, right? So if your goal is to detect Mimikatz, uh, you know, and you're looking for a single hash, they could change Mimikatz by changing a byte. Now they've bypassed that, but you're going to have no false positives. And then broad is like, I, you know, the uh, very broad would be like, I want to detect lateral movement. Well, you're going to have a, a ton of false, false positives, uh, maybe less false negatives. Uh, now, like the question is, is where do, where does something get labeled a false negative, right? Because like you're going to detect it and maybe alert on it, uh, but somebody's going to mark that as a, you know, mark, close that ticket because they're just inundated with tons of, tons of alerts. All right, uh, Matt, you. Yeah. So that, that's, that's one of the things I wanted to say uh, for that subject in specific and i think i brushed the subject uh, in my talk but is that not all detection that you're gonna build are ticket worthy so if you go broader you might want to have a dashboard or a weekly report that you're going to produce on that output and someone can look at it manually maybe once a week or maybe once a day depending on how uh, verbose it is but you don't need your detection don't always need to create a ticket and it don't need, always need to be handled by your SOC handles. They can be handled by other people. Uh, I worked for an organization in the past where they had uh, people that were not security specialists, but they looked at report daily and they, they kind of became the anomaly detection by themselves. They knew that every day you would have, and I'm just give throwing numbers here, but let's say 10,000 firewall block and uh, one 100,000 allow. And if these margin change by a significant amount, they just raise the flag to another uh, to analysis and say, look into this. This kind of deviates from my manual trend. And they were making these trends in Excel at that time. That was a, a few years back, uh, of course. But it's still, I, I think now, uh, that's a little bit maybe what Igor is doing with, with machine learning and, and now these things exist. But for, for teams that don't have that, it's still possible to have people that are maybe not security specialists and do this type of work uh, once they are even a security specialist uh, to review things and understand what is normal. We, we often talk about we need to know what is normal in your network. And this is one very good way to learn what is normal. You make those dashboards, you look at your different security solution, and you look at the ins and outs or the block and allow, and you can quickly make trends uh, for that. Uh, so, yeah. And if I may add, there's also a, a term that um, I, I, my family's team that, that, that works on a lot of the countermeasures we deploy it uses is the risk-based, right? RBA, risk-based analytics. The idea is very simple. There are events, many events, right, that trigger things. But there are events that require context. And, and depending on the risk and the score that you have, they become notable. They, they allow um, analysts to jump in and say, this is meaningful. I want to go and look into it. 
it takes time. And this is, again, iteration. You really want to continue to go into that cycle to, is this working? Is this not? Um, and I think one of the things we haven't talked about, but I want to kind of mention briefly is um, I found that for me to be successful on threat hunting, there is obviously the team, but there are other people that are in the trenches. You know, the, the SOC analysts know a lot and the engineer, the sysadmins, and they can provide a lot of feedback into what's normal or not normal, what could be a false positive or not. So um, find a way to communicate with them, to interview, to have meetings, to uh, get them involved into, into this detection cycle that you build because they will be bring a lot of value and they will be your partners. So it's worth to account for them too. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, we got we're running out of time here, but I wanted to close up on uh, just one little point. So we were talking about uh, ways that you could handle uh, these types of situations. And so Dr. Anton Chuvakin, who I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with from uh, from Twitter, um, but I think he works at Chronicle um, these days. He has a blog post called "On Threat Hunting Detect." Uh, on threat hunting or threat detection uncertainty is what it's called on threat detection uncertainty. Um, and he, he says like uncertainty is like, how do you know that you're doing a good job at this? Right. Um, and he says there's three things that you can do to kind of deal with this false positive problem. One is uh, improve alert triage, which is one of the things that Igor touched on in his talk, which is uh, provide the analysts with the th things that they need. Also, Matthew, you talked about this with the playbooks, provide them with the things that they need to efficiently and quickly and accurately triage alerts, right? Um, another one is use multi-stage detection, which is also something that Igor touched on with the unsupervised and then supervised machine learning aspect, right? So like you, you can have multiple steps to your detection process. It doesn't have to become an alert immediately. You can, you can step through. And then lastly is split bad from interesting, which is what you just kind of described, Matthew, which is uh, you have things that you know are bad and you have things that you know are you know, interesting, but you don't know for sure that they're bad. And maybe you have different pipelines that those go down and you treat them differently and you have different resources allocated to them. So that that's kind of, uh, I thought that that was a very informative blog post. Um, and it, I think we, you guys kind of both touched on those concepts during your talks and I thought it was interesting. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately that's the end of our time. Hopefully we can continue this, this talk at some point in the future. I really was enjoying it. Um, it's always a shame how, you know, short the, how short of a time frame you have. You, we could just talk for hours. But uh, thank you again to uh, Norsec for uh, having us on for the detection engineering section of the of the program. And also thank you to everybody, Igor Kozlov, Matt, Matthew Sonier, and Carlos, a.k.a. Plug. So appreciate it, guys, and uh, hope to talk to you soon and continue these conversations. Just, oh, just one thing. Yep. Just one thing. Today is Igor last day as a non-dad. So I want to raise my glass, Igor, uh, to that. And I uh, really hope that uh, everything will go fine for you and that you will enjoy being a dad. Yeah, Thank you so you. much. I appreciate it. Have a look. Norsec cup in front of me. Love. <laughs> awesome. Cheers. Congrats. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you so much. Awesome. So back to, you, back to the, the organizers. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.